Lately, my videos have focused on getting off your duff, overcoming fear, and jumping in to do what it takes to make progress on your layout. So why has this project of mine been sitting idle for nearly four years? Is it because I'm a poser? A hypocrite? Or just a flat out jerk? Th that's hurtful. No, I'm pretty sure it's because this project has a level of complexity that goes beyond any structure project I've ever done before. And with that comes a certain level of fear. But in my video on projects I vowed to finish in 2023, I set a goal to get the structure done by the end of March. And for the record, I did. Here it is on April 1st. So how did I do it? Stay tuned and find out. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot, where we give model railroaders the knowledge, tools, and services they need to build a realistic layout and the motivation to work on it right now. Have you ever had a complicated project that on one hand you were really excited about, and on the other hand you kept putting off because, well, because the whole thing just intimidated you? Me either. Hey, are you lying to those people again? No. Are you sure? Maybe. All right, fine. This one scared the bejesus out of me. Happy? In this series of videos about the Crown Cork and Seal building at Eastern Avenue, we're going to talk about just such a project and how one simple goal and another unrelated one kicked the whole project into high gear. Now, back to that complicated project. Here are some photos of the prototype structure and the area that surrounds it. Years ago, all this was the Crown Cork and Seal complex in Baltimore. These days, it's been broken up into a lot of different sections which house any number of companies and industries. But back then, it housed one very large company. The B&O ran right by the building and crossed Eastern Avenue all right there. Now, I like this because it's got a lot of different looks, styles, and textures. So when I decided I needed something to fill the corner of my layout, as well as hide two staging tracks, this seemed like a great choice. Even though the industry is not rail served, it would provide a lot of visual interest, including some desperately needed elevation changes to break up the monotony of the flatness here. And here starts the complications. You can see the building has a lot of elements to it. Certain parts of the building are at track level while others are below that area. And let's not forget the tower, which just juts up here as well. Here's how the area in question on the layout looked not too long ago. Now I built these landforms in 2018 and started the building in 2019. And then it sat pretty much idle as I got bogged down with all kinds of issues, real and imagined. But more on that in a minute. Side note, some people have asked me, why Baltimore? Why Chessie? Why Conrail? Well, to find out more about that, check out my episode on the Around the Layout podcast. Hosted by Ray Arnott, this weekly podcast delves into the history and story of individuals in the model railroading hobby, like me, to uncover the why behind their layout. Ray runs an interesting and informative podcast each and every time, so check out the links in the description below. You can also find the podcast at aroundthelayout.com or at the major podcast outlets. When I made that list of projects to finish by the end of the year, the Crown Cork and Seal building was high on the list, with a goal completion date of March 31st. Now around the same time I set that goal, I also decided that it was time to expand the layout, because why would I ever want to concentrate on just one thing and get it done, right? Yes, I have a problem. The expansion meant it was time to finally put in some crossovers in this very area. Without going into detail, we decided to replace the ceiling tile span that has been here since I built this section with gator foam, which would allow me to represent the bridge by attaching the girders right to the gator foam instead of building a separate bridge structure. What this also meant was that the gator foam surface would get tacked down so we could wire, which in turn meant that it would instantly become harder to access the areas underneath for scenicing. And so my friend Tom looked at me and said, well, you'll just have to have this section finished by next modeling session. He was joking. I think, but I did take it as a challenge to really ramp up the effort on this, especially if the plan was to finish the building by the March 31st deadline anyway. The structure itself currently has three distinct sections, which I'll call the curtain wall, the multi-level section, and the tower. The rest of the project includes the railroad bridge, the road bridge, the road surfaces, and other scenic elements. Now that's too much to cover in a single video, and as of this filming, I'm not done with the scenery anyway, so I'm going to break this into multiple videos covering the various sub-assemblies. In this video, we'll cover the construction of the curtain wall. As I mentioned, way back in a previous decade, I started construction. Now my plan for the structure was to build the long curtain wall section from DPM modular parts and then kit bash pieces from a Walther's REA transfer building kit to represent the portion that 
juts out a little bit and drops down to be at road level with Eastern Avenue behind the railroad bridge. That's a long sentence. <laughs> At that point, I wasn't sure how I was going to represent the tower. I got the appropriate DPM pieces and windows and started gluing. And then I remembered something. I got as far as you see here before getting frustrated with the DPM parts. Now, I've had this experience in the past, and it's honestly kind of put me off of them for the most part, because no matter how hard I try, I can never seem to get them to mesh quite as well as I hope. And it's really a shame, because otherwise they look and work great. It also quickly became clear that I was going to need a lot of bracing in the back to keep the long wall runs from breaking apart during normal handling. Something that was driven home when literally each wall assembly broke in two pieces over time. I then spent more time than I want to admit trying to figure out how to support the structure to keep it straight and upright. I considered thick styrene strip, which would have been good for bracing, but I was never convinced it wouldn't interfere with the trains on the tracks behind. And then it hit me. Gator foam. For those not familiar with gator foam, it's like foam core on steroids. It has two sides surrounding a foam center, but instead of the paper surfaces on each side that you'd find on regular foam core, gator foam features a wood product. It's strong, dimensionally stable, resistant to warping, and essentially waterproof, yet it's still easily cut with a utility knife. I've used it for all kinds of things, including the bench work and backdrop for the grunge. To learn more, visit gatorfoam.net and talk to my friend Dave Myers, and don't forget to tell him I sent you. I decided I'd be able to attach the plastic structure to gator foam, so long as I added some styrene to bring the gluing surface level with the height of the windows in the back. It would provide the added bonuses of keeping the run straight and not allowing any light to shine through from behind. I got in gear once the weather turned nice. As you can see here, I set up outside to do my painting. Notice I'm wearing shorts. Since I'm recording this narration in early April of 2023, in Massachusetts, I'll let you guess how long ago that was. I used Krylon Color Max Red Oxide Primer for the brick. It provided nice coverage and a rich brick red color that will tone down in a little while. For the window frames, I used Krylon Anvil Gray from their chalky finish line, which I think gives a nice grimy black look. Since I plan to use plastic solvent cement to attach the pieces together, as well as to attach the windows to the building, I needed to remove the paint from the gluing surfaces. I used a screwdriver to remove the paint here, although I've used the blade from a hobby knife in other instances. Now the solvent works by melting the plastic pieces, and then the plastic on each side melts together and re-solidifies as the solvent evaporates, but it won't activate on a painted surface, thus the removal. I also painted the gator foam I was going to use the same oxide color. Once this was done, I promptly put the pieces aside where they sat for another nine months. In my head, I was worrying about how I'd kitbash the multi-level section, what to do about the tower, and more. It just became easier to ignore it altogether. For years. While taking abuse from my crew. Until goal setting saved me. Fast forward to a few weeks ago. With the March 31st goal date looming, and a lot of work to do to get the structure, not to mention the scenery, finished, I finally got serious about making progress. I made a mock-up of the building, including a 3D printed tower I got from a friend, more on that in a later installment, to make sure everything was going to fit as I planned, and also to understand what I was going to need to change on the ground to make everything fit. The mock-ups are simply made from plain old foam core that I bought at the dollar store, traced to match the kit sections I was using as my starting point, and then trimmed down as I needed to to work with the pieces as they'd actually fit on the model. When I started in earnest, the first thing I did was glue the windows into the openings on the DPM structures. I'd already adhered the window glass, in this case transparencies painted with black paint on one side, to the mullions using Future Floor Polish. Now this product is now sold as Pledge Revive It, but I still refer to it as Future because, well, because old habits die hard. I'll include a link in the description below. While I like using the floor polish to adhere the window material to the frame, in retrospect, it was a mistake to do it so early in the process. It generally holds up pretty well if you can put it in place and then leave it alone. But in this case, I ended up having to handle the windows repeatedly, and the glass came off on many of the windows, which meant having to reapply the floor polish and allow it to dry, as you see here. What I should have done is waited until the end, just before I was ready to attach the wall to the gator foam. 
The next step was repairing the splits on each course of the walls. Each one had split at some point along the run into two sections, simply because of the lateral forces that were placed on it when moving them. The glue on the pilasters just wasn't enough to hold them together with that much bend going on. I did that for all three levels, but before going to the second and third tiers, I added some bracing to the lower edge of the bottom set. I'd done some measurements before putting in the windows and determined that the DPM window frames, or at least the part that remains raised on the back of the structure, was just shy of 80 thousandths of an inch. So I decided to use 80 thousandths styrene of various widths along the back of the building. Doing so would give me two things. One, it would provide additional bracing so that I'd have to worry less about resplitting the pieces during construction. Two, it provided a consistent height between the window frames and the styrene so that when I glued on the gator foam, it would have maximum gluing contact points. I used 80 thousandths by 156 thousandths styrene for the side to my left, but on the right on your screen, because it fit well underneath the windows next to the personnel door. But for the rest of the edges, I used the maximum width I had, which was 80 thousandths by 250 thousandths or a quarter of an inch. Again, I'm using plastic solvent cement for this, and in this case, using liberal amounts of it to get as much adherence as I can. I mentioned these window issues before, and as you can see here, I had to do some more reapplication, and honestly, this wasn't the last time. Live and learn. Next, I moved on to the second course. Now here, I'd use DPM parts cast to represent two-story sections. After gluing the two sides back together, I added some bracing on the back, and for this portion, I used 80 thousandths by 125 thousandths, or eighth inch styrene. Note two things here. One is that I left gaps in a few places at the panel joints to add vertical bracing later. Second, when working with the plastic cement, especially with longer pieces like this, it's sometimes useful to tack the piece down by just adding a little cement to the ends, just enough to get the piece to set so you don't have to hold it in place anymore. At that point, it's still loose enough to make adjustments, but stuck down enough that the applicator brush won't move the piece around. Then you can add cement around the whole piece to fully adhere it. Now I use Same Stuff Solvent from Micromark. As the name suggests, it's the same as other solvents on the market at about half the price. Next came the top floor. I planned to use gator foam for the roof, so I wanted to add a course of styrene that would set the roof height correctly. To do this, I first placed the styrene but didn't glue it. Because of how close the windows are to the top, I had to use 80 thousandths by 80 thousandths strip here. I then used a level as a guide and clamped a piece of gator foam that was the correct thickness to the level. I could then butt the styrene up to the gator foam and tack the pieces in place before removing the gator foam and applying a full dose of cement to lock the styrene in place. Now it was time to glue the tiers in place to create the vertical face. I mentioned leaving space for the vertical supports earlier, and this is where they'll come in. I put supports of 80 thousandths by 250 thousandths, again, quarter inch styrene on each end, and then in three locations in the interior at panel joints. I then lined up the first and second tiers and attached each vertical support, providing just enough pressure while the solvent set to minimize the gaps between tiers while not making the whole thing buckle and break apart. I repeated this until the first and second tiers were attached all the way across. I then went back and repeated the process for the top tier. Doing each tier separately allowed me to adjust the placement of the top floor to ensure accurate location of the pilasters. And you can see the final result here. I set that aside to allow the solvent to evaporate completely and for everything to set. While I did that, I double checked my measurement and then cut the gator foam to eight inches tall. When the solvent was set, I used medium CA to coat the surfaces where the styrene would adhere to the gator foam and set the first piece in place. I cut the remaining piece to fit, which left me with enough gator foam for another use I'll talk about in a minute. I used my one, two, three blocks as some weight and left that section to set up for a while. Incidentally, my one, two, three blocks also came from Micromark and I'll put links to those as well as the same stuff solvent in the description below. With that taken care of, it was time to test the curtain wall out on the layout and replace the mock-up. You can see here that I had to be careful to balance the wall so that it would stand and I definitely didn't want to have to worry about that long term, which brings us to the next step. Using part of the remaining gator foam and some 3 8 inch square wood strip, 
I built some legs to attach to the building that would prevent the curtain wall from tipping over, bridge the two hidden tracks, and provide solid support for the roof. I knew that the top leg needed to be four and three quarter inches to bridge the two tracks, so I cut those pieces out as well as the corner braces from three eighths inch wood strip using my mini chop saw, also from Micromark. Then use the gator foam pieces to measure down from where the roof would need to sit to get the height for the leg at the back. Those of you with sharp eyes will also note that I've added the cornice layer at the top before doing this step. I then cut the pieces to size and using wood glue assembled the legs and set them up to dry, again using my one, two, three blocks to provide support. Wood glue is the preferred adhesive for gator foam because unlike foam core, the outer surface is essentially wood and the result is a good solid joint. Now it was time to tone down the brick color and give the building, which at this point is supposed to be decades old, even in my time frame of July 1984, some age. As it stands now, the building looks brand new, or worse, freshly painted. I mixed up a wash of 70% isopropyl alcohol and Deco Art American Buttermilk craft paint, but really any off-white color will do. Some people prefer gray instead of the beige, and that's fine too. I tested for flow and density on a scrap piece of brick sheet that I'd painted to roughly match the building, and it seemed fine. I don't have an exact formula, I just added alcohol to a few drops of paint until the consistency was similar to skim milk. I started to apply the wash to the building with a small brush. This is meant to represent both the mortar between the bricks as well as to give the brick itself the appearance of some age. I'll be honest, this took a while because I was using a relatively small brush, and next time I'd probably go with a slightly larger brush. I also found, even after my testing, that it was going on a little heavy for my taste, so I ran some alcohol over the surface to further dilute what was already on the building, and also added more alcohol to the wash itself. After that, I was pretty happy with it, and finished coating the building. When it dried, I liked the look of it, although it was pretty bright in some places, but that's okay because my plan was always to add another wash of Black India ink to tone down the beige and give the structure a dirty, grungy, no pun intended, look. I have two strengths of Black India ink wash that I use, 1 to 60 and 1 to 120. I started with the 1 to 120 to give it a base. I started light because you can always add more to darken it up later. And I did, adding additional coats to the surface until I was satisfied with the look. With this done, it was time to attach the legs to the back of the structure. I glued them on using wood glue and let it dry for another couple of hours to ensure it would hold up. Finally, I installed the newly completed curtain wall in its designated spot and checked to make sure it wouldn't interfere with the operation of cars on the tracks behind. I then added the rest of the mock-up back in place and prepared to start working on part two. I know it's a hobby, and some people say they should have the freedom to work on something, or not, depending on what they feel like that day, and that works for some people. But for me, deadlines work. As you can see, without them, things sit, sometimes literally for years. But all it took to get this project done after four years of procrastination was me making a verbal commitment to someone, in this case, you, my viewers, to get me in the right frame of mind to get it done. If this sounds like you... Know that I offer mastermind groups that can help you set goals and stay on track. I also offer lots of other services like layout consultations, track planning, custom backdrop photo creation, and more. To get more information, you can drop me a line at jparker at thepixeldepot.com. In our next installment, we'll cover the construction of the kit bash section of this crown cork and seal building, so keep your eyes peeled for that video. Have you ever built a long wall from DPM modules? How'd it work out for you? Got any tips for me? I'd love to hear all about it in the comments below. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Links are also in the description below. If you want to learn more about ways to set and achieve goals to make progress on your layout, you can click on the link in the upper left. For more great content, click below that. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room.